All right, well, good morning. Thanks for joining us. We are live in Eddie's living room, and so uh, we thought it was going to be a little bit more stormy today, but I guess it just means that you guys have the opportunity to uh, hang out at home with us. And so make sure you grab your coffee, and if you went to Dunkin' Donuts like I did this morning, uh, then grab your donut. But um, thanks for joining us. We're going to sing two songs, uh, Death Was Arrested and Day of Victory. And uh, if you want to, go ahead. You can see that in the link uh, for the Facebook video here, you see there's a link, driftwaychurch.com slash worship, and that has lyrics. So if you want to sing with us, go ahead and click that link, uh, and you can pull that up on a separate web browser or however you want to do it. Uh, but just sing along with us if you do know the words. And we're going to sing Day of Victory first, as I forgot already. All right. <laughs>
Facebook Live, we did have Beach Day Monday, and we had a couple baptisms this week. So if you saw on Facebook, we posted some of those pictures. Uh, but if you guys were right in the comments below right now, uh, normally we do praise jar or blessings or whichever has come uh, for you this week. So if you'll just post that in comments while we play this next song, Death Was Arrested, uh, then that way you guys can rejoice and uh, celebrate with each other.
and sin and death, Lord. Uh, I thank you that um, you freed us from that. Um, Lord, so I pray that we would choose to kill the sin that killed you. Um, I pray that we would fight against sin every day. Um, I pray that if there's someone who doesn't realize they're a sinner, um, I pray that, that you would just show them that today so that they could recognize that they need a Savior. Lord, um, and so I pray that you would speak to each of us, reveal sin in our lives, make us more than you. Um, God, just speak and let us hear you clearly. Um, I ask this into your name. Amen. All right, well, good morning, and uh, uh, I bet you've uh, never under uh, had anybody teach you about how a hurricane and donuts are related. Now, uh, there's only two donuts in here, and a hurricane actually has three, and I know they belong to Keone, and right now he's looking at them like, you're not really going to touch my donuts, are you? And, and I am going to touch them, but Keone, if you want donuts, I will go get you new donuts, so don't freak out right now, all right? So anyway, so uh, I'm not sure if you know or not, but uh, the way a hurricane is kind of born is, even this time of the year, it's, it's coming off the Africa coast, it's spinning, it's a low pressure, and all of a sudden... Kind of, it's just like one donut, sort of. And it starts drawing its source of power from the hot water in the ocean. And that hot water starts coming through the middle of that donut up there. And it starts coming with enough power and, uh, that it starts kind of spinning. And before you know it, it starts adding. And all of a sudden, now it's not just a lower level low, but now it's kind of got a a mid-level low, and somebody must have eaten the other donut, but it's, so we've only got a two-tiered do, uh, donut hurricane today, but then what happens is it gets going, and then you have a third donut on top, and you can see there's a clear hole in the middle, and that is an exhaust, so as it's taking heat from the ocean, it's going up, and it's going up with such force, it's spinning, and it's hitting the upper levels that are super icy cold, man, and forming just hellacious thunderstorms, kind of like what, when we get regular thunderstorms. And, and then it just rains back down, it just keeps feeding itself. If you uh, really want a better explanation, you can go ahead and Google it up if they haven't taken that off. But uh, Google it up and see how a hurricane is actually formed, and it's amazing what God does. But a hurricane is born... When a low pressure system comes off with a little bit of spin, a little bit of potential, and then it, but it doesn't turn into a tropical system until it gets all of its power from the heat of the ocean. And so as I was sitting around last night, kind of getting ready to go to bed, and I was uh, praying and um, kind of tidying up things for a message for today, find out God wanted me to do uh, James chapter 5, which is where we would normally be at. Um, he, uh, uh, well, I got distracted, and, and I started looking on Facebook at a guy named Levi Cohen who does this page called Tropical Tidbits, and he puts these little tiny, maybe five-minute to 14-minute little videos together once a day, and he's actually a meteorologist, and he's a guy where uh, even Mike's weather page gets a lot of stuff from, and he was, gonna, he was telling us, he said, if you really want to know what's going on with um, uh, Hurricane or now Tropical Storm Isaias, right? Is that how we say it, Keone? Isaias. Isaia. Oh, it's Isaia. That's what it is. Isaia. It is Isaia. That's how they're saying. But anyways, if you really want to know what's going on, he said, here's what's happening. He said, so as the hurricane was born, you know, and, and then the hurricane starts growing, all right, it's a two-tier, maybe three-tier, as it was coming into Florida, what was happening is we were getting southwest winds coming in really strong. So every time it would build up to three donuts, what would happen is those winds up high would knock off the top donut. And so we were left with two donuts best. And he said, what's happening now, because there's only two donut, he said that every time it builds up, it'll go up one donut, it'll go up two. He wasn't using donuts, but I'm using that for you. It would come up one level, then it would, come, it would grow and it would bubble. That's the word Mike was using, to bubble the thunderstorms up again. But once it got to the third level, the upper level, it was high enough where those winds would knock it off again. And you can see when it gets knocked off, it messes up the exhaust, messes up the hole. And so he said, what would happen today is this. 
He said it would start growing. You're going to see it. It's going to start growing. And everybody's going to say, oh, it's bubbling up. It's growing. And he said, but once it gets to that ultimate height where now it's going to regenerate, now it's going to come and be a, a hurricane again, a bigger hurricane or grow, it's going to get the top knocked off it again. And it, so it's going to go back down to a one-level donut. Then it's going to be a two-level donut. Then it goes to the third level and it gets knocked off again. And he said, if it happens to be a two-level donut, this is me using it, my own words for this, if it happens to be a two-level donut when it's right off your coast, then you're going to get some pretty good storms coming in. In fact, right now, they're about 50, 60 miles right off of West Palm Beach. And so just keep your eyes and ears open because if when it comes up into the Treasure Coast, it is indeed a two-level donut, we may actually get some good wind. We may get some good rain. If not, you may not even know it's there. But the fact is, is that the storm doesn't need to be born again. It just needs to be strengthened. And, and it doesn't need to be born again because the storm was born the first time when it spun off of Africa with a little bit of potential, but not even. It could do anything on its own. But when it started drawing its power from the source of the hot water, when that hot water from the ocean became its source of power, it was now born, if you will, again. Not as a tropical low or as a low pressure, but it was now born as a tropical system. And from that point on, it is now classified as a tropical system, a depression, a wave, a depression, a, a, a storm, a hurricane, and so on. And when God is done with this hurricane, or he's done with this tropical storm, um, then obviously it's done. And you know, I was thinking a lot about us. And in our lives. Now, when we come into this world, we might be the tail end of a cold front. And it just spins enough, and all of a sudden, we start drawing our, our power from the heat of the ocean, which I'll equate to God. Once you start drawing your power from the power of God, now he empowers every part of you. Once that's where your source of power is, you are now born again. You're not just a, a, a little tail end of a cold front. You're not just a tropical wave. You now have the potential to be a mighty, mighty hurricane, which, by the way, if you don't know, hurricanes have a very valuable uh, purpose. If there were no hurricanes, the ocean would get too hot. Everything would die. We'd burn up. We'd blow up. We need oh, hurricanes to suck the heat out of the ocean. That's how God cools the ocean every year and keeps things mixed up. But you, once you come into this world, you might be the tail on that cold front. You might be a just a low pressure system. You might be a little wave. You might be something. But when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, and now from this point on, you are going to draw all of your power from God Almighty, you are now a tropical system. And though I want to equate that because as I was thinking about it last night, God brought me to John chapter 3 and the story with Nicodemus about being born again. So that's what we're going to be is in John chapter 3. I'm going to look at the first 16 verses. And verse 16 is one that you are very familiar with. But John chapter 3, verse 16, uh, the, the message is very easily entitled, You Must Be Born Again. If, as her, if a, a wave, if a, if a little tail of a cold front, if a low pressure is ever going to be a mighty hurricane, it's got to be born again. And what makes it born again is where it gets its power. What makes you uh, born again is where you get your power. You become born again when you surrender everything you know about yourself to everything you know about him. And all of a sudden now, all of your power comes from God Almighty. Now, just like the donuts, all right, some of you may be in a situation right now where, where you're just a one-tier donut. <laughs> you know, you're spinning, you got some power from God, but every time you grow a little bit, boom, some circumstances knock that top level yeah. off. Maybe you're a two-tier donut, and, and, and somebody's knocked your third level off. But the fact is, is when you get all of your strength and power from God Almighty, you become impervious to that. In fact, if this, this storm were to be bigger and more powerful and more mighty, then this little shear coming out of the southwest would have no hope of knocking the top tier off every time it grew up, every time it built. That's what's happening every time. Like right now, it's bubbling. It's got the second level. It's trying to get the third, and the wind's going, poof, and it blows it off, and it's going to blow it off until it becomes a one-tier donut. So again, 
if you're born again, man, you could be a one tier, two tier, or three tier. But the fact is, is that's chocolate. <laughs> but the fact is, is that you must be born again. So here it is, John chapter 3, starting in verse 1. I want to tell you, first of all, your first birth was not adequate for salvation. Your first, that's what Nicodemus' problem was. He was born as a Jew. He's a religious leader of the Jew. He was remembering prophecy from Ezekiel chapter 36, which you can look up later, probably around verses 24 through 28, um, where it was promised that at some point that God was going to bring Israel together. He was going to give them a heart for him, and they would know that because they'd have leaders following him, and I'll maybe read that prophecy later. And he thought they had already arrived. I'm a Jew. I'm a leader of the Jew. I'm a devout Pharisee. I've got to be quote-unquote, born again, and they didn't use that terminology until Jesus just brought that up. But he thought his first birth as a Jew was good enough for him to be able to get to heaven and have eternal life. The way many of you, hopefully not, but many that I talk to are thinking that because, man, I grew up in church. Man, my mom was a Sunday school teacher. My grandmother was a Sunday school teacher. My dad was a pastor. My Man, generations go back. I've been in church. I ask people all the time, when did you get born again? When did you give your life to Christ? How, when did this start? And they're like, well, I don't know when I gave it to them, man. Dude, I've always been a Christian. No, you haven't always been a Christian. When you came into this world, you came into this world as a sinner, selfish, only desiring you. And if you did anything religious, anything loving, anything good, it was because it had eternal, it had some, some temporal benefits to you right now. And you have to be born again. That's what's got to happen. You've got to be born again. Don't make the same mistake that Nicodemus made. So I want to tell you, if you've never been born again, your first birth was not adequate for salvation. I don't care if your mama was a Christian. I don't care if your nurse was a Christian, if the doctor was a Christian. I don't care if your nurse is, I don't care if you've been a Christian school your whole life. It does not matter. You personally must be born again because your first birth is not adequate for salvation. Listen to this. It says in verse 1, Now there was a man of the Pharisees. Pharisees, dude, I challenge you to be more religious than a Pharisee. They were in church all the time, fasted at least three times a week, tied 30% of their income. Man, they did it all. They had to memorize the first five books of the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, um, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They had to memorize all five books. How many of y'all had that memorized? How many of y'all line up to God and say, Oh, yeah, I have, you know I have memorized all four, five books of the Bible. Here it is. Let me into heaven. You won't even qualify there. And that didn't qualify Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. His name was Nicodemus, and he was a ruler of the Jews. So not only was he a Pharisee, but dude, he was part of the Sanhedrin. He was part of the ruling party. And as a Pharisee, he wanted everything Jewish, everything right according to the law that he had memorized. And he did everything in his power to make it that way. More religious, I challenge you, than any one of us. This man came to Jesus by night. And a lot of people make a big deal. He's hiding from his brother. He's a busy dude. He might have just come by night because that's when he had time. He might have come secretly because he didn't want anybody to see him representing the group that he's, you know, asking Jesus questions on behalf of. But we don't know. It's not important. It says, he came to Jesus by night and he said to him, Rabbi, and here he is giving Jesus the ultimate compliment. Here is a teacher of teachers, a leader, a ruler of the Jews giving Jesus props, saying, Rabbi, I'm putting you on equal footing with me. Rabbi, you know what? I'm coming to you as a peer, not as a superior. But he still had it wrong because when you come to Christ, you have to come to him inferior, and he is the ultimate authority. You come to him as master, savior, Lord, not equal, equal footing. He thought he was doing something, coming to him on equal footing, saying, oh, Rabbi, peer, Listen to this. He came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, my equal, my peer, we know that you're a teacher that's come from God. Okay? You, we know you came from God. Jesus is getting ready to try to discern, how do you know I came from God? Listen to how he discerned that he came from God, which is not a good way to discern that someone comes from God. All right? He said, Rabbi, we know you've come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. 
If that is how you determine someone is from God because of the signs that they do, you are going to get misled. Because the devil, the Antichrist, as forever, the devil is an Antichrist and the devil is a deceiver. That's just what his name even means. He took Jesus up on a mountain and showed him the whole universe. If he could show Christ that, what can he show you? The devil does many signs and he has many workers to do these signs. And the Antichrist is going to be king of them when that all goes down. And so, again, if you're determining somebody's from God because you see a sign, you are severely misled. You need to go to the Word of God. And you need to find it in context. You need to read the, the passage. You need to read the chapter. You need to read the book. You need to read the testament. You need to read the entire thing and see how it all lines up and see if somebody is truly from God because you can't make that determination just because you see a sign. But Jesus knew where he was coming from, and Jesus worked with him a little bit here. He says, man, we know you're a teacher. It's come from God. No one can do these signs uh, uh, that you do unless God's with them. Well, that's a lie right there. Verse 3, Jesus answered, and look what he said. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Because it's a spiritual thing. So he says, man, Nicodemus, you came in this world like a donut. <laughs> You came, you, you came in this world, and, 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 and yeah, you look good, you, you kind of have some religious potential, but you got to be born again to be a tropical system. you got to be born again to be a spiritual system. It doesn't come from the flesh. It doesn't come from your nature. You can't muster it up. You can't go to church enough. You can't learn enough scripture. You can't get enough seminary degrees. You have to be born again. And he says, born from above, the word John uses can be translated as, mm, not chocolate, but the word that John uses, born again, can be um, translated as again and above, which is the same thing. If you're going to be born again, you have to be born from above. You have to be born from God. And so he's saying, you've got to be born from God. And, and you can't even see the kingdom of heaven because it's a spiritual thing. And so truly, truly, I say to you, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? <laughs> no, I don't think any mother in the world will volunteer for that job, all right? But what I'm saying is, is that he's like, dude, how do I get born again? Come on, man, I was born a Jew. I was born a believer. I was born a God follower. I was born. No, you're not. You might be born into a religious family. You might even be born into people who are born again. But there are no second generation Christians. You personally have to be born again by surrendering everything you know about yourself at one point in time to everything you know about him. That's how you become born again. Nicodemus is saying he's probably going back again to that prophecy maybe. You know, in Ezekiel 36, please read that later. Uh, verse 25 or 24 on. He's like, yeah, look, man, we've got this religious resurgence. This is the fulfillment of Ezekiel 36. Look, here it is. I'm good. What am I going to crawl back in my mom's womb? What are you talking about? Remember, we're peers now. And Jesus is like, no, we're not. And so Jesus comes back to him again. And um, in verse 5, and Jesus said, you notice how he didn't address his argument? He just told him the fact. Jesus said in verse 5, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, there's a lot of different interpretations on what that means, being born of water and the Spirit. Now, in that prophecy that I keep referring to in Ezekiel chapter 36, he said, I'm going to wash you with water. And when I wash you with water, then you're going to now have a desire for me. Your heart's going to be changed. The rule, you're going to want to do from the inside out what I want you to do. And many people believe that's where it is, and, and that could possibly be what, what he's talking about. You, you got to be born of, of water, um, you know, and you got to be born of the Spirit. And another translation of that water is, is a natural birth. In fact, Ashley's sitting on my couch right now, and she is great with child, and Alana could be born at any given time right now. But we're hoping that the first sign for Alana being born and you needing to rush to the hospital is what? The water breaks. And uh, again, boom, water breaks. It's like, woo, it's time to go. It's a, uh, you know, and, and, and it's part of the natural childbirth. And so he might be saying, you got to be born physically, which, which, yeah, 
And, and then you get to be born, and then you've got to be born spiritually. You've got to be born twice. Some people say you've got to be washed by the word. Some people say it's baptism. It is not baptism. You do not have to be baptized to be saved. Baptism is a picture of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It's no different than my ring. I take this ring off. I'm still married to my wife. If I put this ring on a donut, my wife is not married to that donut unless I eat way too many and I become a donut, right? It's a symbol of, of you dying to your old life, rising to live a new one. Baptism doesn't save you. It's a picture of your salvation. So, again, Nicodemus said, how can I be born again? You know, I can enter my mom a second time. Verse 5, Jesus said, true, true, I say unto you, unless you are born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. If you take it according to that prophecy in Ezekiel, born of water means he washes you. He gives you a new spirit, and then you are born again. You can't be born again without being born again by him. He's the only one who can make you born again. And so he said, unless you're born of water and of the spirit, you cannot even get into the kingdom of God. He says, you can't see it, you can't get in, which is almost the same thing. You can't participate in the spiritual kingdom until you're born again. Can you participate in church? Absolutely. Can you sing all the worship songs? Absolutely. Can you do religious things? Absolutely. Can you become a deacon? Can you be a pastor? Can you be a teacher? Yeah, you can do all those things. But you can't be born again until you're born again. You've got to be born again. He goes on in verse 6 and kind of explains it, which may give us an idea of what he's really talking about in verse 5. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. So whatever you can do in the flesh, dude, you can do it in the flesh. Your flesh, when you come into this world as, as that little spin, uh, that little, little tail end of a cold front, when you come in as that little tropical wave that's open, he said, you can do whatever little open tropical waves can do. But until you start getting your source of power from the heat of the ocean, until your source of power is from God Almighty, he said, you can't become a hurricane. You can't be born again until God is your source of power in this. So he says, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, which is born of the spirit is spirit. You've got to be born again spiritually to be able to do spiritual things. So when I ask you, when were you born again? When did you give your life to Christ? I'm not saying you have to have a date like me. I know for me it was Christmas of 1987 when I was in the Catholic Church. And I saw, uh, prior to that, I saw I was in there with drug my dad back to church. I, I saw the back of a bulletin, a Catholic study Bible, and I told my dad, I said, Dad, if I don't get anything for Christmas, I want this Bible because I've never had one. I believe I was 24 at the time, somewhere around there. And, and my dad said, what, are you going to be a priest? I said, no, dad, I like girls too much. And yeah, I said, I just want this Bible. And Christmas in 1987, my dad got me this Bible. And I know it was the Holy Spirit of God that put that desire in my heart. I started reading it and reading it. And at that time, that's what I told God. I was like, God, if, you can, if you're for real, and I believe you are, and you can salvage anything out of this life, Man, it's yours, and louder than audibly, he said, I want you to be a preacher. And I'm like, who am I going to preach to people I sold drugs to? He said, for starters. I said, I can't be like those guys on TV. He said, I don't want you to be like them. I want you to be you that follows me, and I'm going to use you. And I said, good, because I don't know what I'm doing. And he said, good, then you won't get in the way. And anytime I'm following him, I don't get in the way. Anytime I think I know what I'm doing, I do. And then it was June 27, 1988. That a Hungarian Jew that God brought all the way from Hungary got born again, didn't even know why he was there. That guy asked if he could bring a guy from church over to my house and, and do a Bible study. I said, yeah. And it was there on this hassock that I had done every sinful thing man could do. Man, I don't even want to mention them here. Every sinful thing you could imagine I did on that hassock. As I was growing up, and especially in the previous few years, and there he shared the Romans road, shared the gospel, that if I would surrender my life to Christ, that I could have eternal life, that I prayed, not begrudgingly. I was like, where do I sign on the dotted line? Why did I do that? Because God had made me born again. He had given me a new desire to surrender everything I knew about myself to everything I knew about him. So on that wicked place, that hassock, that that, that I had done every sinful thing. I gave my life to Christ and I was free. June 27, 98. I'm not saying you got to have a date. I'm not saying you got to have a verse to it. I'm saying there's got to be a time in your life where you just said, I'm, never, I'm not in charge anymore and you are. 
And I, if I'm going to let you be in charge, I can't do it in the flesh. I've got to do it in your power. That's baptism. Man, I take you under the water. There's a death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But you're saying, I'm dying to my old life. But the only reason I can come back up and live a life you want me to live is through the power of the resurrection. If you're doing it in the flesh, you're possibly not born again. You've got to give everything to him at some point in time. So Jesus said, man, I say to you, unless one's born of water, born of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So I'm telling you, your first birth is not adequate for salvation. You've got to be born again. You've got to know there's been a time where you surrendered yourself to him and he took over. There's got to be lasting results. I use the illustration all the time. If I were to stick my tongue in this little electric socket here, that's just 120 volts, man. I got some, I got some 220 or 110. I got some 220 out here. I stick my tongue on that. Dude, there's going to be lasting results. There's going to be an outward expression of that action. Now imagine plugging into the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and saying, my life never changed. That is a lie straight from the pit of hell. When you give your life to him, your life is turned upside down. And if God's giving you the desire and ability to do that right now, do it. Because that's the next part. Your second birth is an opportunity that you must respond to when God offers it. It's not an open offer. It's not like, oh, here it is. You can do it anytime you want. Well, you can do it anytime you want. But you're only going to do it when you have the desire. And the desire comes from him. And the desire may come, the desire may go. It's not guaranteed to ever come back once it leaves. But if the desire is there, then you need to act upon that. Listen to verse 8 in John chapter 3. He's trying to describe it. He said, the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear it sound, but you don't know where, where it comes from. You don't know where it goes. Hey, man, we've got a lot of wind off our coast right now. How many of you know where this wind is going? The wind's coming. We could walk outside and we could say, all right, it's coming from that direction, but do you really know where it came from? Okay. Do you, do you know which level in the atmosphere it actually came from? Do you know where it came from? All right, well, okay, yeah, it came from the hurricane, from the storm. Do you know where it went? How many of you ever watched a little balloon go? You, you let a balloon go, and what happens? It's going, 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 and all of a sudden it disappears. You never see the end of it. And he says this. He said, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear it sound but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes so it is everyone who is born of the spirit you don't know when it's coming you don't know when it's leaving but you know when it's there so if you're there today and saying oh the holy spirit is telling me i need to give my life to christ i'll do it tomorrow i'll do it after this message i'll do it later I'll do it when I finish this. I'll do it when my spouse dies. I'll do it. I'll do it whenever. I've heard so many excuses, so many reasons. But the fact is, if you have it right now, there's no guarantee the next second it is going to be there. There's no guarantee. I'm not saying it isn't, but there's no guarantee it's coming again once it leaves. That's the desire to surrender everything you know about yourself to everything you know about him. You do it when it's there. Because you are going to stand before God one day and you're going to be judged based on your life or Christ's life. I know I have already blown perfection and if I were to stand for him, I have earned a free trip to hell. But I chose when he gave me the deal to surrender my life to him and he said, hey, guess what? What Christ did on the cross now can be applied to your life. So when you face judgment, I'm going to look at Christ's record to judge you. Is that a good deal or what? That's the deal I took June 27, 1988, and I'm offering to you. I'm not offering. I'm telling you, God's offering it to you right now. So the wind blows where it wishes. You, you hear this sound, but you don't know where it comes from, where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born. But everyone, you're not the exception. You get a desire from God, and you jump on it, or you neglect it and let it go. You, it's your choice. Verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? In other words, if he's going back to that prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 36, he's like, you know, look, Jesus, I've been teaching this stuff way longer than you. I'm an old man. <laughs> Little did he know. <laughs> and, and, and later we know Nicodemus did get saved. And maybe not here, but he did get saved. And so, so, so he's like, dude, I've been, I've been with scholars, with rabbis. They've been around a lot longer. How can this be that the prophecy's not been fulfilled? How can this be that, that we need to be born again? 
And so Jesus says in verse 10, he answered them and said, are you really a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? What the heck have you been teaching Israel? A bunch of heresy? You been teaching through, I am teaching you the truth, Nicodemus, so you can teach Israel the truth. And, it, and Nicodemus got that eventually. Not quite here yet. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, verse 11, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we've seen, but you do not receive our testimony. In other words, we, me, and he, he, Jesus talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's saying, we, we invented this. We have lived in this. I have come here to tell you all this, but you're not receiving my testimony. He said, man, I've tried to explain this thing through earthly terms with the wind and with birth and childbirth and all these things, he said, if I try to tell you these earthly things and you don't get it, he said, how can, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? If you can't get the illustration I'm giving you with the donuts, he, Jesus is saying, with the birth, with, with the wind, he said, man, what if I just started with the heavenly things you'd never get? I've got to make it something you can relate to. Look at this, verse 12. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 13. He says, no one has ascended into heaven except he who's descended from heaven, the Son of Man, which is the very one Nicodemus is talking to. He's saying, look, Nicodemus, I am the only firsthand witness you are going to get to hear this from. I've been there. I've been here for eternity. I was part of the plan. I'm part of the solution. I am the solution. He said, Nicodemus, I'm telling you the truth. You've got to get this. So again, your first verse is not adequate for salvation. The second one is an opportunity that you've got to jump on when God offers it. Because if you don't jump on it when he offers it, you don't want it and you never accept it. But when you do, you receive eternal life. And eternal life is not a quantity of life. It is a quality of life that starts the moment you give your life to him. You are now free. You're not working for salvation. You, he has changed you from the inside out. Your desires are different. Now you desire to do what he wants you to do. And you crucify the flesh so that you can walk in the spirit. So listen to verse 14. He said, here's how you start this eternal life. He gives him another illustration that he understands that he's probably taught on many, many times. And even probably taught on, this is the, a picture of the Messiah. And it's out of uh, Numbers chapter 21, I believe. Verse 14, John chapter 3, verse 14, he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So the picture is this. If you want to go back and study this this afternoon, man, you go back to Numbers chapter 21, and the Israelites were grumbling and mumbling after God. God, you're not going to take care of us. God, you always just mess us up. God, every time things are going good, man, we get mad. And God's like, oh, really? And so he brought serpents all in there. You say, what a cruel God to bring snakes to bite and kill people because they were getting bitten, they were dying. They cry out, Moses, tell God we're sorry. Tell God we're sorry for trouble give us a solution. Isn't that what we always want, a solution to make things normal again? Instead of getting ourselves a solution to get us closer to him, God's always trying to offer a solution to get us closer to him because he loves you more than anyone can love you. So what happened? Man, he said, Moses... The kind of harebrained idea, I always come up with these, and according to man, they're harebrained, not according to me. He said, I want you to get a big old stick, I want you to make a statue of a snake, and I want you to lift the statue of this snake up. And anyone, they don't even have to touch it, they don't have to lick it, they don't have to have it injected in them, they don't have to, all they have to do is look at the snake on the pole, the fake snake on the pole, and if they believe that is the cure, then they will instantly be healed and they will not die. According to man, that's a harebrained idea, isn't it? But God, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His logic is nowhere near ours. God is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. He far surpasses us. Here's God, and we don't even qualify. God said, look at this snake, man. Just look at it and believe. Well, I'm not going to do that. That's stupid. How's that going to work? Well, good, die. But it's not God's fault. God brought those snakes. He brought those things in their life so that they could, they could see. They, they would bring them closer to him. And Jesus said, remember how, how God did that with Moses and the snake? He said, well, guess what? I'm going to be lifted up on a cross. And all the, those that will look at me and realize they're sinners and believe that what I'm doing on this cross will pay for their sins and it's the only way their sins can be paid for, they can't pay for them at all. And boy, that killed a Pharisee. 
who all their righteousness was in their discipline and discipleship they had and their rigorous schedules, man, of pleasing God. And it took it all out of their hands. He said, just like Moses and the snake in the wilderness, you look at the cross and realize what I did will pay for it all. And all you have to do is believe. And that word believe means to put your faith and trust in. Really, truly trust in it. Not try it out, but put all your faith and trust in it. Said Nicodemus, you do that, man, you'll be saved. Because verse 15, whoever believes in him will have eternal life. A life that starts at that moment and goes on forever. Last verse, you guys know this verse. John 16, uh, 316. You see, dude, the rainbow wig dude in the end zone back in the day. Now it's probably got a cardboard cutout rainbow if you even watch that stuff. But anyways, for God so loved the world. God loved the world that he wanted to make a way for the world to be reconciled so sin can be paid for so he is a just God, but he can have you living with him in perfection, being perfect. God so loved the world that he gave. He didn't make you earn it, didn't make you qualify for it, didn't make you pay for it. He gave. He's freely offered. June 27, 1988. Dude, I was shown from the word of God how this gift was freely offered to me. It was a deal I couldn't believe. And I took it. And since that time, my faith in it has grown even more. My faith in God has grown more to know that this God, as I love him and trust him, I can trust his deals. But he so loved the world that he gave his only son. He'd rather die than live without us. He made the, own, the only way to pay for our sins. That whoever, are you a whoever? Anybody, if he's making this forever, everybody needs it. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The key word is believe. You've got to believe in him. You know, if you've ever come to Driftwood, you've heard me explain this a million times. It's like standing on a chair. Right now, I'm just standing on the bottom rungs of this stool right here. And, and, and I'm believing in it. If these rungs let me go, if they, they failed me, I would fall. I'd twist my ankles, I'd break them, I'd be on crutches. But I'm trusting them with everything I have. Right now, i got a foot on the ground and a foot on the rail, or a rung. Now, that's not trusting. That's like saying, God, in case my plan doesn't work out, I, I'm, I'm going to start going to church and I'm going to start. Uh, I want to do things your way, see if that works out. And if things start working out, God, maybe I'll put another rug on. But God doesn't say... Believe, he doesn't say, uh, he, he's not in the, in the business of proving it to you so you believe. God says, believe in me, and then I'll prove it to you. I'm encouraging you right now to believe what the Word of God says. And that is that your first birth is not adequate. You, as cute as you were as a baby, mm -hmm. as awesome as little Alana is going to be, man, as soon as they get all that guava cream cheese stuff off her and cut that umbilical cord and clean her up, I'll hold her and she'll be awesome. <laughs> she'll be beautiful. But she's going to need to be born again at some point in her life if she's going to experience the kingdom of God. You need to be born again to experience that. And the way you're born again is by just simply looking and saying, I need to be born again. If you're still arguing about whether you need to be born again in your own head and you're arguing with God, you're not there yet. No. If God's given you the desire and ability to believe that without him, you have a free trip to hell, and that's all you can qualify for. And he's given you the ability to believe that what he did on the cross pays for your sin. It's like the wind. It's coming. It's right here, right now. Accept it. You're, it's not going to blow forever, man. Tomorrow you make it wake up, and it's going to be dead calm, and no seams biting you. Know, where'd that desire go? And it's gone, and without the desire, you can't do it. But give your life to Christ. Man, again, hurricane starts out, and it starts out as just a wave, tail end of a cold front, a little low pressure system. It's not tropical. In fact, some of them even turn subtropical. You know what subtropical is? That's someone who goes to church and tries to be religious. They look like a hurricane, but they're not, because their source of power is not Jesus Christ. You come off the coast, man, you're out there, and all of a sudden, when you start drawing all your energy, from God, the way a hurricane draws it from the hot water, guess what happens? It starts growing. 
If Karen was here, I'd say, Karen, if you take with faith, if you don't use it, you what? She'd say, you lose it. If you do use it, what happens? You get more. So guess what? There's another. It starts building. And a hurricane that is clicking on all cylinders has three levels, a mid-level, and a lower level, a mid-level, and upper level. And, the, and it's perfectly lined up. It may hit the mountains of Haiti and temporarily be like that. But man, if it starts drawing its source of power from the ocean again, guess what? It lines up again. It may get off the coast of Florida and wind shear blows it apart. But if it draws its energy from the hot water, man, it lines back up. And for you, you may be born again. And you may not feel like it. You may feel like this, hurry, this storm out here, defeated like a tropical storm. Like the hurricane's got to draw all of its power from the heat of the ocean. You've got to draw all your power. From God Almighty. So whether you're doing that for the first time to be born again, or you're doing it for the eight millionth time as a believer, that's the solution. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving me this message last night and the ability to even deliver it today. My prayer, Father, is that someone would be born again. Man, it would be so awesome to eliminate somebody right now from that Matthew chapter 7 line where the church is lining up and, and instead of all being in the same line, you're separating them, sending some of them to hell and they're going, wait, didn't I preach? Didn't I teach? Didn't I heal people? Didn't I do miracles? Didn't I do all these things? And you said, yeah, but you and I never had an intimate relationship. And they go off and burn in hell. Father, if this, you would take these words of yours with the power of your Holy Spirit and Father, you would would, would blow so hard in someone's life, Father, that they cannot deny you. I pray someone will be saved in the church from that Matthew 7 line, and they would truly get born again. I pray someone who's never given their life to Christ, they know they've never given their life to Christ, man, that they hear this, and Father, that the power of your words and your Holy Spirit and your love would come through, and they would realize what an awesome deal it is that you are offering them, and like me, However long ago it was, they would accept it. Father, I pray today someone will get born again. And I pray those who are born again would start drawing all of their strength. Not from Facebook, not from social media, not from their friends, not from their sulking. But they would draw their strength from meditating on you and doing what it is you ask them. They would draw all of their power and strength from you, Almighty God. And I pray for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. That's chocolate. <laughs>